Chapter Thirteen of the Autobiography of Anthony Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Autobiography of Anthony Trollope on English Novelists of the Present Day. In this chapter, I will venture to name a few successful novelists of my own time with whose works I am acquainted and will endeavor to point whence their success has come, and why they have failed when there has been failure. I do not hesitate to name Thackeray the first. His knowledge of human nature was supreme, and his characters stand out as human beings, with a force and a truth which has not, I think, been within the reach of any other English novelist in any period. I know no character in fiction, unless it be Don Quixote, with whom the reader becomes so intimately acquainted as with Colonel Newcombe how great a thing it is to be a gentleman at all parts how we admire the man of whom so much may be said with truth is there any one of whom we feel more sure in this respect than of colonel newcombe it is not because colonel newcombe is a perfect gentleman that we think thackeray's work to have been so excellent but because he has had the power to describe him as such and to force us to love him a weak and silly old man on account of this grace of character it is evident from all Thackeray's best work that he lived with the characters he was creating. He had always a story to tell until quite late in life, and he shows us that this was so not by the interest which he had in his own plots, for I doubt whether his plots did occupy much of his mind, but by convincing us that his characters were alive to himself. With Becky Sharp, with Lady Castlewood and her daughter, and with Esmond, with Warrington, Pendennis, and the Major, with Colonel Newcombe and with Barry Lyndon, he must have lived in perpetual intercourse. Therefore, he has made these personages real to us. Among all our novelists, his style is the purest, as to my ear it is also the most harmonious. Sometimes it is disfigured by a slight touch of affectation, by little conceits which smell of the oil, but the language is always lucid. The reader, without labor, knows what he means, and knows all that he means. As well as I can remember, he deals with no episodes. I think that any critic examining his work minutely would find that every scene, and every part of every scene, adds something to the clearness with which the story is told. Among all his stories there is not one which does not leave on the mind a feeling of distress that women should ever be immodest, or men dishonest, and of joy that women should be so devoted and men so honest. How we hate the idle selfishness of Pendennis, the worldliness of Beatrix, the craft of Becky Sharp. How we love the honesty of Colonel Newcombe, the nobility of Esmond, and the devoted affection of Mrs. Pendennis. The hatred of evil and love of good can hardly have come upon so many readers without doing much good. Late in Thackeray's life, he never was an old man, but towards the end of his career, he failed in his power of charming, because he allowed his mind to become idle. In the plots which he conceived, and in the language which he used, I do not know that there is any perceptible change. But in the Virginians and in Philip, the reader is introduced to no character with which he makes a close and undying acquaintance. And this, I have no doubt, is so, because Thackeray himself had no such intimacy. His mind had come to be weary of that fictitious life which is always demanding the labor of new creation, and he troubled himself with his two Virginians and his Philip only when he was seated at his desk. At the present moment, George Eliot is the first of English novelists, and I am disposed to place her second of those of my time. She is best known to the literary world as a writer of prose fiction, and not improbably whatever of permanent fame she may acquire will come from her novels. But the nature of her intellect is very far removed indeed from that which is common to the tellers of stories. Her imagination is no doubt strong, but it acts in analyzing rather than in creating. Everything that comes before her is pulled to pieces so that the inside of it shall be seen, and be seen if possible by her readers as clearly as by herself. This searching analysis is carried so far that, in studying her latter writings, one feels oneself to be in company with some philosopher rather than with a novelist. I doubt whether any young person can read with pleasure either Felix Holt, Middlemarch, or Daniel Deronda. I know that they are very difficult to many that are not young. 
her personifications of character have been singularly terse and graphic and from them has come her great hold on the public though by no means the greatest effect which she has produced the lessons which she teaches remain though it is not for the sake of the lessons that her pages are read seth bede adam bede maggie and tom tulliver old silas marner and much above all tito and romola are characters which when once known can never be forgotten I cannot say quite so much for any of those in her later works, because in them the philosopher so greatly overtops the portrait painter, that in the dissection of the mind the outward sign seems to have been forgotten. In her as yet there is no symptom whatever of that weariness of mind, which, when felt by the reader, induces him to declare that the author has written himself out. It is not from decadence that we do not have another Mrs. Poyser, but because the author soars to things which seem to her to be higher than Mrs. Poyser. It is, I think, the defect of George Eliot that she struggles too hard to do work that shall be excellent. She lacks ease. Latterly, the signs of this have been conspicuous in her style, which has always been and is singularly correct, but which has become occasionally obscure from her too great desire to be pungent. It is impossible not to feel the struggle, and that feeling begets a flavor of affectation. In Daniel Deronda, of which at this moment only a portion has been published, there are sentences which I have found myself compelled to read three times before I have been able to take home to myself all that the writer has intended. Perhaps I may be permitted here to say that this gifted woman was among my dearest and most intimate friends. As I am speaking here of novelists, I will not attempt to speak of George Eliot's merit as a poet. There can be no doubt that the most popular novelist of my time, probably the most popular English novelist of any time, has been Charles Dickens. He has now been dead nearly six years, and the sale of his books goes on as it did during his life. The certainty with which his novels are found in every house, the familiarity of his name in all English-speaking countries, the popularity of such characters as Mrs. Gamp, Micawber, and Pecksniff, and many others whose names have entered into the English language and become well-known words, the grief of the country at his death, and the honors paid to him at his funeral, all testify to his popularity. Since the last book he wrote himself, I doubt whether any book has been so popular as his biography by John Forster. There is no withstanding such testimony as this. Such evidence of popular appreciation should go for very much, almost for everything, in criticism on the work of a novelist. The primary object of a novelist is to please, and this man's novels have been found more pleasant than those of any other writer. It might, of course, be objected to this, that, though the books have pleased, they have been injurious, that their tendency has been immoral and their teaching vicious, but it is almost needless to say that no such charge has ever been made against Dickens his teaching has ever been good from all which there arises to the critic a question whether with such evidence against him as to the excellence of this writer he should not subordinate his own opinion to the collected opinion of the world of readers to me it almost seems that i must be wrong to place dickens after thackeray and george eliot knowing as i do that so great a majority put him above those authors my own peculiar idiosyncrasy in the matter forbids me to do so I do acknowledge that Mrs. Gamp, Micawber, Pecksniff, and others have become household words in every house, as though they were human beings. But to my judgment they are not human beings, nor are any of the characters human which Dickens has portrayed. It has been the peculiarity and the marvel of this man's power that he has invested his puppets with a charm that has enabled him to dispense with human nature. There is a drollery about them, in my estimation, very much below the humor of Thackeray, but which has reached the intellect of all, while Thackeray's humor has escaped the intellect of many. Nor is the pathos of Dickens human. It is stagey and melodramatic, but it is so expressed that it touches every heart a little. There is no real life in Smike. His misery, his idiocy, his devotion for Nicholas, his love for Kate, are all overdone and incompatible with each other. But still the reader sheds a tear. Every reader can find a tear for Smike. Dickens's novels are like Boussicot's plays. He has known how to draw his lines broadly so that all should see the color. 
he too in his best days always lived with his characters and he too as he gradually ceased to have the power of doing so ceased to charm though they are not human beings we all remember mrs gamp and pickwick the boffins and veneerings do not i think dwell in the minds of so many of dickens's style it is impossible to speak in praise it is jerky ungrammatical and created by himself in defiance of rules almost as completely as that created by carlyle to readers who have taught themselves to regard language it must therefore be unpleasant but the critic is driven to feel the weakness of his criticism when he acknowledges to himself as he is compelled in all honesty to do that with the language such as it is the writer has satisfied the great mass of the readers of his country both these great writers have satisfied the readers of their own pages but both have done infinite harm by creating a school of imitators no young novelist should ever dare to imitate the style of dickens if such a one wants a model for his language let him take thackeray bulwer or lord lytton but i think that he is still better known by his earlier name was a man of very great parts better educated than either of those i have named before him he was always able to use his erudition and he thus produced novels from which very much not only may be but must be learned by his readers he thoroughly understood the political status of his own country a subject on which i think dickens was marvellously ignorant and which thackeray had never studied he had read extensively and was always apt to give his readers the benefit of what he knew the result has been that very much more than amusement may be obtained from bulwer's novels there is also a brightness about them the result rather of thought than of imagination of study and of care than of mere intellect which has made many of them excellent in their way it is perhaps improper to class all his novels together as he wrote in varied manners making in his earlier works such as pelham and ernest maltravers pictures of a fictitious life and afterwards pictures of life as he believed it to be as in my novel and the caxtons but from all of them there comes the same flavor of an effort to produce effect the effects are produced but it would have been better if the flavor had not been there i cannot say of bulwer as i have of the other novelists whom i have named that he lived with his characters he lived with his work with the doctrines which at the time he wished to preach thinking always of the effects which he wished to produce but i do not think he ever knew his own personages and therefore neither do we know them even pelham and eugene aram are not human beings to us as are pickwick and colonel newcombe and mrs poyser in his plots bulwer has generally been simple facile and successful the reader never feels with him as he does with wilkie collins that it is all plot or as with george eliot that there is no plot the story comes naturally without calling for too much attention and is thus proof of the completeness of the man's intellect his language is clear good intelligible english but it is defaced by mannerism in all that he did affectation was his fault how shall i speak of my dear old friend charles lever and his rattling jolly joyous swearing irishman surely never did a sense of vitality come so constantly from a man's pen nor from man's voice as from his i knew him well for many years and whether in sickness or in health i have never come across him without finding him to be running over with wit and fun of all the men i have encountered he was the surest fund of drollery i have known many witty men many who could say good things many who would sometimes be ready to say them when wanted though they would sometimes fail but he never failed rouse him in the middle of the night and wit would come from him before he was half awake and yet he never monopolized the talk was never a bore he would take no more than his own share of the words spoken and would yet seem to brighten all that was said during the night his earlier novels the later i have not read are just like his conversation the fun never flags and to me when i read them they were never tedious as to character he can hardly be said to have produced it corney delaney the old manservant may perhaps be named as an exception lever's novels will not live long even if they may be said to be alive now because it is so what was his matter of working i do not know but i should think it must have been very quick and that he never troubled himself on the subject except when he was seated with a pen in his hand 
Charlotte Bronte was surely a marvellous woman. If it could be right to judge the work of a novelist from one small portion of one novel, and to say of an author that he is to be accounted as strong as he shows himself to be in the strongest morsel of work, I should be inclined to put Miss Bronte very high indeed. I know no interest more thrilling than that which she has been able to throw into the characters of Rochester and the governess in the second volume of Jane Eyre. She lived with those characters, and felt every fibre of the heart, the longings of the one and the sufferings of the other. And therefore, though the end of the book is weak and the beginning not very good, I venture to predict that Jane Eyre will be read among English novels when many whose names are now better known shall have been forgotten. Jane Eyre and Esmond and Adam Bede will be in the hands of our grandchildren when Pickwick and Pelham and Harry Lorrequer are forgotten because the men and women depicted are human in their aspirations, human in their sympathies, and human in their actions. In Villette, too, and in Shirley, there is to be found human life as natural and as real, though in circumstances not so full of interest as those told in Jane Eyre. The character of Paul in the former of the two is a wonderful study. She must herself have been in love with some Paul when she wrote the book, and have been determined to prove to herself that she was capable of loving one whose exterior circumstances were mean, and in every way unprepossessing. There is no writer of the present day who has so much puzzled me by his eccentricities, impracticabilities, and capabilities as Charles Reed. I look upon him as endowed almost with genius, but as one who has not been gifted by nature with ordinary powers of reasoning. He can see what is grandly noble and admire it with all his heart. He can see, too, what is foully vicious and hate it with equal ardor. But in the common affairs of life he cannot see what is right or wrong, and as he is altogether unwilling to be guided by the opinion of others, he is constantly making mistakes in his literary career, and subjecting himself to reproach which he hardly deserves. He means to be honest. He means to be especially honest, more honest than other people. He has written a book called The Eighth Commandment on Belief of Honesty in Literary Transactions, a wonderful work, which has, I believe, been read by very few. I never saw a copy except that in my own library, or heard of any one who knew the book. Nevertheless, it is a volume that must have taken very great labor, and have been written, as indeed he declares that it was written, without the hope of pecuniary reward. He makes an appeal to the British Parliament and British people on behalf of literary honesty, declaring that should he fail, I shall have to go on blushing for the people I was born among. And yet of all the writers of my day, he has seemed to me to understand literary honesty the least. On one occasion, as he tells us in the book, he bought for a certain sum from a French author the right of using a plot taken from a play, which he probably might have used without such purpose, and also without infringing any international copyright act. The French author not unnaturally praises him for the transaction, telling him that he is un vrai gentleman. The plot was used by Reid in a novel, and a critic discovering the adaptation made known his discovery to the public. Whereupon the novelist became angry, called his critic a pseudonym uncle, and defended himself by stating the fact of his own purchase. In all this he seems to me to ignore what we all mean when we talk of literary plagiarism and literary honesty. The sin of which the author is accused is not that of taking another man's property, but of passing off as his own creation that which he did not himself create. When an author puts his name to a book he claims to have written all that there is therein, unless he makes direct signification to the contrary. Some years subsequently there arose another similar question, in which Mr. Reed's opinion was declared even more plainly, and certainly very much more publicly. In a tale which he wrote he inserted a dialogue which he took from Swift, and took without any acknowledgment. As might have been expected, one of the critics of the day fell foul of him for this barefaced plagiarism. The author, however, defended himself, with much abuse of the critic, by asserting that whereas Swift had found the jewel, he had supplied the setting, an argument in which there was some little wit, and would have been much excellent truth had he given the words as belonging to Swift and not to himself. The novels of a man possessed of so singular a mind must themselves be very strange, and they are strange. It has generally been his object to write down some abuse with which he has been particularly struck 
the harshness for instance with which paupers or lunatics are treated or the wickedness of certain classes and he always i think leaves upon his readers an idea of great earnestness of purpose but he has always left at the same time on my mind so strong a conviction that he has not really understood his subject that i have ever found myself taking the part of those whom he has accused so good a heart and so wrong a head surely no novelist ever before had combined in story-telling he has occasionally been almost great among his novels i would especially recommend the cloister and the hearth i do not know that in this work or in any he has left a character that will remain but he has written some of his scenes so brightly that to read them would always be a pleasure of wilkie collins it is impossible for a true critic not to speak with admiration because he has excelled all his contemporaries in a certain most difficult branch of his art but as it is a branch which i have not myself at all cultivated it is not unnatural that his work should be very much lost upon me individually when i sit down to write a novel i do not at all know and i do not very much care how it is to end wilkie collins seems so to construct his that he not only before writing plans everything on down to the minutest detail from the beginning to the end but then plots it all back again to see that there is no piece of necessary dovetailing which does not dovetail with absolute accuracy the construction is most minute and most wonderful but i can never lose the taste of the construction the author seems always to be warning me to remember that something happened at exactly half-past two o'clock on tuesday morning or that a woman disappeared from the road just fifteen yards beyond the fourth milestone one is constrained by mysteries and hemmed in by difficulties knowing however that the mysteries will be made clear and the difficulties overcome at the end of the third volume such work gives me no pleasure i am however quite prepared to acknowledge that the want of pleasure comes from fault of my intellect there are two ladies of whom i would fain say a word though i feel that i am making my list too long in order that i may declare how much i have admired their work they are annie thackeray and rhoda broughton i have known them both and have loved the former almost as though she belonged to me no two writers were ever more dissimilar except in this that they are both feminine miss thackeray's characters are sweet charming and quite true to human nature in her writings she is always endeavouring to prove that good produces good and evil evil there is not a line of which she need be ashamed not a sentiment of which she should not be proud but she writes like a lazy writer who dislikes her work and who allows her own want of energy to show itself in her pages miss broughton on the other hand is full of energy though she too i think can become tired over her work she however does take the trouble to make her personages stand upright on the ground and she has the gift of making them speak as men and women do speak you beast said nancy sitting on the wall to the man who was to be her husband thinking that she was speaking to her brother now nancy whether right or wrong was just the girl who would as circumstances then were have called her brother a beast there is nothing wooden about any of miss broughton's novels and in these days so many novels are wooden but they are not sweet-savoured as are those by miss thackeray and are therefore less true to nature in miss broughton's determination not to be mawkish and missish she has made her ladies do and say things which ladies would not do and say they throw themselves at men's heads and when they are not accepted only think how they may throw themselves again miss broughton is still so young that i hope she may live to overcome her fault in this direction there is one other name without which the list of best-known english novelists of my time would certainly be incomplete and that is the name of the present prime minister of england mr disraeli has written so many novels and has been so popular as a novelist that whether for good or ill i feel myself compelled to speak of him he began his career as an author early in life publishing vivian gray when he was twenty-three years old he was very young for such work though hardly young enough to justify the excuse that he makes in his own preface that it is a book written by a boy dickens was i think younger when he wrote his sketches by boz and as young when he was writing the pickwick papers it was hardly longer ago than the other day when mr disraeli brought out lothair and between the two there were eight or ten others 
to me they have all had the same flavor of paint and unreality in whatever he has written he has affected something which has been intended to strike his readers as uncommon and therefore grand because he has been bright and a man of genius he has carried his object as regards the young he has struck them with astonishment and aroused in their imagination ideas of a world more glorious more rich more witty more enterprising than their own but the glory has been the glory of pasteboard and the wealth has been a wealth of tinsel the wit has been the wit of hairdressers and the enterprise has been the enterprise of mountebanks an audacious conjurer has generally been his hero some youth who by wonderful cleverness can obtain success by every intrigue that comes to his hand through it all there is a feeling of stage properties a smell of hair oil an aspect of blow a remembrance of tailors and that pricking of the conscience which must be the general accompaniment of paste diamonds i can understand that mr disraeli should by his novels have instigated many a young man and many a young woman on their way in life but i cannot understand that he should have instigated any one to good vivian gray has had probably as many followers as jack shepherd and has led his followers in the same direction lo there which is as yet mr disraeli's last work and i think undoubtedly his worst has been defended on a plea somewhat similar to that by which he has defended vivian gray as that was written when he was too young so was the other when he was too old too old for a work of that nature though not too old to be prime minister if his mind were so occupied with greater things as to allow him to write such a work yet his judgment should have sufficed to induce him to destroy it when written here that flavor of hair oil that flavor of false jewels that remembrance of tailors comes out stronger than in all the others though there is falser even than vivian gray and lady corisand and the daughter of the duchess more inane and unwomanlike than venetia or henrietta temple it is the very bathos of story-telling i have often lamented and have as often excused to myself that lack of public judgment which enables readers to put up with bad work because it comes from good or from lofty hands i never felt the feeling so strongly or was so little able to excuse it as when a portion of the reading public received Lothair with satisfaction. End of chapter 13 Recorded with a cold by Jessica Louise, Minneapolis, Minnesota